So um, we are in the middle of um, seeing more sparkle in practice. Um, I hope you have followed the other videos. Today I'm going to um, go uh, beyond the simple patterns that we have explained so far, which are really the, the core of sparkle and where we have um, explained things in, in a lot of detail, to be honest. And uh, first have a look at the outer level of the query, so to speak, and uh, discuss some very simple but very important uh, features nonetheless of Sparkle, and they will be um, selection, modifiers, and aggregation. And it will still be a short video. So welcome back. Uh, my name is Markus Krutsch. These are the videos on knowledge graphs. And um, as I said, there's uh, more on Sparkle and uh, knowledge graphs in the videos before that, which you should also watch. Right, so um, as I said so far, we have talked about basic graph patterns, which are the, the heart of a Sparkle query, where you say, what is the pattern that you would like to match? Now, in order to make these full queries, you have to put something around. And you have seen this in all the examples I have given you so far. Um, the, uh, we have used select as a query type. And when you specify select, you state uh, what you want to have as a result of the query. It's quite simple. But um, normally we have only used it in a very simple way by just giving variable names of the things that we would like to have in our result mappings, in our solution mappings, as we have called them. But uh, select can actually do a bit more than that. So it's not just that you specify what is returned and what you want to remove. Removal of parts of a query result is called projection in databases. So what we do is we project out some of the variables that have been bound when we uh, matched the query, but uh, which we don't want to see. Yeah. So this is projection. Um, but in addition, you can actually also compute some derived values from the things that you have found in your solution. And it's also possible to use aggregates, which is also a way of computing derived values, but in a slightly different fashion, as we will see. All of these, of course, exist in other database query languages as well. So you may already have a good idea what's going on here. Now, here's a simple example, which shows you the first two things, projection and computation of additional results. Um, here we are asking uh, in the query for cities together with their population density. And in this uh, hypothetical um, knowledge graph, I don't even specify the prefixes, you can imagine them. Um, we have things of type city and we they have a population and they have an area, which I assume here is given in square kilometers. Um, RDF doesn't have a specific way to uh, define the unit of measurement if you have such a quantity. So either you have a fixed unit that is used with every value of the property, as I have suggested here, or you have um, somehow complex values where the unit, unit and the value are both linked from an other auxiliary node that you use to denote the value in the graph. Um, both encodings are used in practice. Um, so here I assume I know the unit, unit in some way. And what I would then do is I want to select, well, the city, first of all. And with every th city, I also want to select the um, result of dividing population by area. And I want this result to be reported as a value for population density. So whenever we return something, we also have to give it a name under which it will appear in the result. City is clear, it is a name for what is bound to city, but for this value, we haven't had a variable yet. So we give it a name here, and this will be the header of the column in the result table, if you like, or the variable that is used in the solution mapping to um, map to this particular uh, outcome here. Okay, so this is how you can use functions in the computation. Um, okay, so this should be quite intuitive and um, easy to use. We will see more examples for this in the exercises again. Now, projection can increase the multiplicity of solutions. This is the second feature that we find that has this ability. Okay, check your knowledge. Have you understood what's going on so far? Sparkle results have multiplicity. So uh, the same result can occur multiple times. We have denoted this by um, thinking about a multi-set of solution mappings. And uh, there was only one case in what I just explained so far, which could cause multiplicity. And that was um, the use of blank nodes. 
that's not true there was another case actually there were also property puffs which i have discussed in my previous video okay so there's two cases um one is the use of blank notes which give you choices and uh, it's not surprising that somehow blank notes uh, give you multiplicity increases because they are similar to um, projection of course a, a blank note is like a variable that you cannot select so you always project it away and uh, in exactly the same way as this uh, it has increased multiplicity with blank notes we will also have projections uh, increase multiplicity if we remove a variable it will behave like a blank note essentially um, so that's one reason and the other reason was the uh, property paths where we also had some other cases where uh, a higher multiplicity could occur okay right um, so let me define exactly what the projection returns well more or less exactly I, I'm, as I said it's mostly English and not so much math but I still call it a definition the projection of a solution mapping mu uh, to a set of variables v is the restriction of the partial function mu to variables in v so this is how we call in mathematics if you take a function and you um, it derive a function that is only defined on some of its domain this is called the restriction and we restrict mu to v um, the projection of a solution sequence is just a set of all projections of its solution mappings ordered by the first occurrence of each projected solution mapping and that's an important thing to kind of clarify if you have um, ordered results from a query and uh, some results occur twice. It's actually possible that they occur in non-consecutive locations in the sequence. And then if you project, uh, it might happen that they look the same. Say uh, maybe you have ordered it up front by something that you project away. And then suddenly things that are naturally in different places in the sequence um, become simplified because you throw away some, uh, you're no longer interested in some variable binding. Um, and then the question is at which position in the list should uh, should the result be where should the solution be placed and um, I define it here to be in the first possible occurrence and I think this is probably what the standard does if it defines it at all um, the cardinality of a solution mapping mu in a solution om omega so the solution is uh, collection of all the solution mappings so is the sum of the cardinalities of all mappings new in omega that project to the same mapping <clears throat> so uh, the sum of the cardinalities so if you have uh, if you have a solution uh, which where every solution mapping occurs only once and you project away uh, some parts of it and this means that because of this projection several entries now look the same because essentially when you project you remove some column of the table um, then uh, of course the cardinality will just be the overall number of things that are the same because they had cardinality one before but if you start with a solution where some things already occur several times so they have a higher cardinality then of course you have to uh, sum up these cardinalities and that's why it's a sum uh, so then, then it could happen that uh, one solution contributes more than one uh, one solution mapping con contributes more than one to the overall cardinality if it already appeared in uh, in a higher cardinality um, <clears throat> basically the definitions that i give here in the formulations i chose i think uh, it works if additional results are defined by functions or aggregates so if you have a solution mapping which somehow has values for derived uh, things that you have specified through functions or through uh, or has values for aggregates it can still be handled in the very same way um, so first we add new bindings to the newly defined things and then we project and so in this sense it's always clear what what the outcome will be um, the keyword distinct is always available in select to remove duplicate solutions which means that you effectively set the multiplicity of any element of any solution mapping in the solution to one right so uh, okay so this is how this works um easy peasy now um there's another easy and useful set of features that I want to mention namely the features which allow you to slice or to return slices of your data and to sort it them by a certain uh, uh, um, uh, feature or inside your solution and um, sorting is done with the keyword order by um, order by defines the desired order of results um, it is put 
after the where clause. So these so-called solution set modifiers that I have on this slide, they all go after the where clause, clause at the bottom. And order by in turn is followed by several expressions. Expressions now is a bit more general, think variables. So things that you have found in your query, you can order by. You could also compute something from the things that you have found in your query and order by that. So this is also allowed. Um, whether you want to have ascending or descending order is your choice and you can specify this by using these modifiers with the expression in, the, in between the parentheses. Um, ascending is the default, so uh, you don't have to specify that, but sometimes it's clear. Um, now you might ask why should order by be followed by several expressions rather than just by one? Why don't we just order by one? Well, um, the reason is that of course it could happen that uh, the criterion that you specify as the first criterion, the population number, is uh, the same for some several of your solutions. So you have several solution mappings, I should say, not solution, in your solution, which um, have the same population number and you order by populations and the, the order within the, this group of same population towns is undefined because they have the same uh, number. So it's not clear what to, should come first. And for such cases, you can specify in this list of expressions, another expression, for example, the label of the city and could order by the label next. So whenever two cities have the same population, you will order them alphabetically by their name which makes sense. At least you have some, some defined output. And um, in Sparkle, this, doing this is very easy and um, uh, Sparkle is able to order almost everything in some way. So you can order IRIs, you can order strings, you can order numbers and it's, you can order dates. And the, what you get is usually what you expect. And in cases where you don't expect anything, like when comparing a date to a string or an IRI to a blank note, you still get something which is good. So <clears throat> it's not going to um, blow up on you. It's not going to throw exceptions. It's still giving you a fixed and defined order if you order by certain things, even if the order is not very important. But sometimes it's just important to have a fixed order so that when you ask the same query again and again, you will always get the results in the same uh, sequence, <clears throat> even if there's no natural way of, uh, of defining how the sequence should look. But it, you want it to be determined and not... Um, depending on, on random internal data structure optimizations that your database management system might be doing in order to find the solutions. You don't want to leave it to the database management system to order the results uh, because that could really give you changing results every time you ask, which is true for every database, by the way. It's the same for SQL databases and um, a typical beginner's mistake to assume that order is preserved if you don't specify any criterion to order. Um, Limit and offset are also available. They have the obvious meaning. You can define the maximum number of results and you can shift uh, the first result to be not the first, but some later result, uh, which is important if you want to do windowing uh, in your retrieval. Think uh, internet search engines. You don't get all the results on one page. You get 10 results on your first page and then you can go to the second and so on. So uh, this is done with uh, limit and offset. Okay, here's a simple example. Now I'm uh, going to use a Sparkle query, which refers to Wikidata. All of these queries have the advantage that you can just go to the Wikidata Sparkle endpoint, uh, the query service that I have uh, introduced to you when I was talking about Wikidata RDF mapping and be executed. And you can directly play with this and it will work. This advantage is uh, I'm using Wikidata identifiers, which are these numeric IDs. So I have to explain what they are. So. They are not self-explaining, obviously. I do this by putting comments, which is supported in Sparkle just in, as in Turtle. So um, if I want to have the largest cities in Germany rank 6 to 15, then I can um, do it like this. I'm looking for things that are instance of city. P31 is instance of, Q515 is city. Last time I checked at least. That was what was used and uh, I want them to be in Germany. So they should have the country property set to the value Germany. And I want to know about their population. This is property P1082 is the population. Uh, I want just to get this because I want to order by this if I find, want to find the largest cities. Then I do an, a descending order by population. Descending means the 
largest value will come on top and everything after which wards will be smaller, which will descend. And uh, I put an offset because I only want to see the results starting from rank six. Offset zero means I start at rank one and so on. So five is rank six. And I want only 10 results. So that's going up to 15. Yeah. Right, so this is how this would work. And um, you can, as I said, try it online and see what you get. <clears throat> right. Uh, now, the next thing I want to talk about are groups and aggregates. These are slightly, but only minimally more complicated, I would say, um, to work with uh, than what I have shown you so far, but it should also be quite easy to follow. So the idea with aggregates is that you compute derived values for your query result, not from a single solution mapping, like I did in my previous example, but from a multi-set of solution mappings. So you take several solution mappings and you compute something based on them. What could you compute from several things? Well, easiest thing, you count them. You, you want to know how many results there are. A very common thing, and we have even seen examples of this before. Um, but you could also want to find the largest value in a set um, or do some, some other thing to compute the average value um, of a certain um, quantity that you have retrieved uh, through uh, querying. So the, the average age of professors at TU Dresden, for example, based on what we know about them in Wikidata, yeah, it could be computed. Yeah? <laughs> okay, um, so these are aggregates and um, often these go hand in hand with grouping because in many applications, you don't want to aggregate all the results, all the solution mappings in your solution by in one step. I mean, you might want to count how many solutions you got overall. This is a typical case where you aggregate everything. But in many other cases, you would like to first group them into smaller blocks and apply the aggregate only on the blocks. So what grouping does is it goes from a solution which consists of many solution mappings individual mappings to a solution that consists of groups of solution mappings where the um, actual solutions that you can then print for each group are only things where the whole group is uh, agreeing on only values which are the same for everything in the group or values that you compute by aggregation okay so these are the uh, two features and this is also briefly written on this slide again so um, I think it's easiest to see this with an example. Um, again, using Wikidata, find the 10 most common professions of people born in Dresden. And you can obviously put any cities there. And uh, if you are interested in another city and what Wikidata and Wikipedia knows about as a city, you can also try that. So I want to select the job profession. And I want to know how many people have this job. And this will be the second part here. I will explain in a minute. Let's first look at the inner pattern. We are looking for a person who is born in Dresden, P19, Q1731. Yeah? Try another city if you know another city and are interested in it. Um, you know how to find the ID. If not, watch the wiki data videos. Um, then we want to get the job of this person. This is occupation property here. Some people have several jobs. It's not strictly speaking legal jobs here but somehow what people have been doing in their life so somebody who has composed even if they never sold a copy of their music is still a composer okay um so this is a bit uh, liberal interpretation of job and so this gives me all the people with all their jobs and many people could occur several times here because they are listed with several jobs several occupations um, what i then do is i group by job which means I form little groups. Um, I split the whole set of solution mappings into many smaller sets, which are formed by um, uh, based on the job. So if all the things that have the same job go, go into one group, and I will have as many groups as I have jobs afterwards. Each of the groups agrees on the job, but has different people inside. So at this point, after since I grouped here, it is not allowed anymore to select the person because for one of these groups, the person will not be clear. It will be many people in uh, having one occupation usually. Um, so you cannot select the person anymore because it's not clear what it should be. Um, but you can select the job because it's always the same for all 
uh, the entries in this group. And in addition, you can count. I count the results here. In this case, I count the diff distinct uh, persons. Uh, they will always be, be distinct by the construction of this in Wikidata. And I, the result of this counting, which is the actual aggregation, uh, I will map to a variable called count. By the way, here this S, I write lowercase, select, I write uppercase. This is not important. I, in Sparkle, you can freely choose lower or uppercase. It's customary to use a lot of uppercase, but here I have used lowercase and it's also fine. Okay, and then I uh, order in descending order to have the highest counts on top and I limit to 10, so I get the 10 most common only, each with the number. Okay, and so, so this is how this works. And you can see from the example that you can do really interesting things with this. And uh, uh, depending on uh, the query you get, you, it might also work without a timeout. But aggregates can also, of course, be quite complicated to compute. Okay, there are several aggregate functions. So this is again one of my yellowish slides, which give technical details, uh, mostly for reference. Um, count is very important. Sum is so-so. It can be important. Average is, I think, fairly practical. Min and max are possible. Um, sample. Uh, this is if you really want to have a have an example of a person who has that job, because somehow you can't believe who has who has got this job at all. Or can you show me one case where this occurs? Then sample is your um, function of choice. So this can sample one value for you out of a group which uh, has different values maybe for a certain variable and then there's this very special thing which concatenates strings inside a group i am not entirely sure why we have that and uh, i mean it's, it, it probably has its uses but then there could be other ways of aggregating you know like doing some statistics over the data set could also be a way of aggregating which we don't have so I don't know why the working group thought this is so important. Um, but but you, maybe there is a, a, a nice reason. Maybe someone else write a comment. Um, okay. Uh, so you can always, um, you, you can use all of these, say, get one expression as a parameter. It can be just a variable, like if I sum over the populations, which might actually be a meaningful use of sum if you want to know if the populations uh, or what are the uh, total number of people who live in cities or in capitals or whatever. Um, you could do it like this. Um, and you can also use complicated expressions here. So for example, if you want to have the earliest year of birth, but the birth date is a date with day and month and other things maybe, uh, then you could extract the year first by a function and then use a minimum. So there's more complicated things you can write inside the aggregates. Um, okay. Um, optionally, everything can be made distinct. If you only want to count distinct values or each value counts only once inside a group in cases where it could occur multiple times, then you have to put distinct. Okay. Right. Finally, um, let me add one more thing. Um, so. Uh, now you have understood aggregation. There is a um, special keyword having, which is related to aggregation. And um, essentially it is part of the query condition, but written after the query in order to specify a condition that is based on an aggregated value that you only get after you have aggregate, grouped and aggregated something. And here's a, an example, and I think this makes it a bit more clear. Um, if you want to find all professions that are shared by at least 100 people or more than 100 people who are born in Dresden, um, it basically means you want to get a list of professions. You may also want to know how many uh, people have this profession. This is the same as I had before, but you want to restrict uh, the re professions that are returned by uh, the number of uh, people who have them. So you want to place a restriction on the aggregate value. And this you cannot really do inside the query pattern because inside the where, first of all, we haven't discussed filters yet. You don't know yet how to specify any kind of conditions of this type. But even if you knew, 
uh, the number of people who have a job is not accessible inside the wear pattern. This is where you get the individual people with their jobs only after you group them and aggregated something only that only after that you can talk about the total numbers. So having goes after this and it says having count of person greater than 100 in this case. Specifying this condition and only only things that satisfy this condition will actually appear in the result. Okay, right. So that's all about um, solution set modifiers, aggregates and good old select. Um, so uh, you know quite a bit now and these can be used in fairly advanced queries, especially aggregate queries can do some amazing things, uh, as I said, if you manage to do it within the timeout. Um, up next, we will be talking about further Sparkle features um, that you will also find useful to, to solve many practical things. And I will go through them one by one uh, to sh and show you examples for each to give you a good um, idea of what's going on there. Um, so uh, thank you very much for now and see you uh, soon in the next video. Bye bye.